Hello, everybody, and welcome to Overthink Podcast series interviewing experts on the five senses. Um, for those of you who listen to the audio version of our podcast, you probably know by now we are doing a five episode series on the senses. You can listen to Overthink on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and you can support us on Patreon as well. And in relation to that podcast series, we are um, posting interviews with amazing international experts on the senses exclusively here on our YouTube channel to sort of pair. And so uh, with that said, David, would you like to introduce... Oh, wait, we should maybe briefly introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Professor Ellie (laughs) Anderson. I teach at Pomona College in Claremont, California. And my wonderful co-host, David, over to you. Uh, Well, I'm David Peña Guzman, and I am a professor of humanities at San Francisco State University in San Francisco, California. And uh, yeah, welcome to our next installation of this series of interviews with experts on the census. And today we have with us Dr. Rabi Aj, who is a neuro-ophthalmologist. So you might um, know that we like to mix things up here at Overthink. Often we have philosophers, sometimes we have scientists. Today it's one of the latter. And uh, he is a neuro-ophthalmologist at the Rothschild Foundation Hospital in Paris, France. Uh, He was trained in medicine at the University of Bordeaux and later worked at other places, including Emory University, uh, where Ellie and I have a personal connection uh, since we also studied there. And he specializes in diseases of the optic nerve, um, as well as in all the visual manifestations of all brain diseases. So if there is a brain disease that manifests itself optically, he is the doctor that you want in that in that clinic, um, in the patient room. And so we are going to talk today about uh, the sense of vision, and nobody is better to talk about that than the person who deals with um, the eye and the connection between the eye and the brain. So thank you, Dr. Ash, for um, being with us today. Thank you for the vision. What a wonderful introduction. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) We do what we can. Um, And uh, you make it very easy. You make it easy. easy. (laughs) Yes. We're on the same, uh, same wavelength here. So let's begin with a very broad question. Um, As I just mentioned, you are an expert on the eye, and that means that you are also, by extension, an expert on vision as as an event or um, as one of our um, sensory modalities. And in your view, what makes vision unique among the senses? Um, So I think we need to define first what a sense is. Uh, a sense is basically the translation of a stimulus uh, to something that makes sense to us. Um, if so, for having a sense, you need a stimulus. In the vision, it's the light. For audition, it's the sound, wave and sound. So all the senses have the same. Uh, it's what what is the same among all the senses is that the stimulus will trigger of uh, a receptor in your body. It can be a full receptor for the vision, it can be a, sense, a, sense, a, a receptor for touch. And then this, uh, this uh, receptor is going to translate uh, the stimulus into chemicals that will go onto a nerve that will translate this chemical into electricity. And then it goes all the way to your brain where uh, at a place where it makes sense. So what made the vision uh, different from the other senses is that the processor for the vision, the part of the brain that can process the information, the visual information, it's much bigger than any other sense. Actually, a third of the brain, a third of the volume of the brain is dedicated to the vision. So that's why we can see so well compared to hearing well. And that's how we have so different visual modalities. It's because we have so much neurons in our brain to understand what's around us visually. So that's what makes the vision different from other senses. Mm -hmm. So it's primarily about the the volume and the dedication of of neurons in the nervous system to giving us really detailed, high-resolution visual objects. Is that it? It's So because you have volume, you have synapses. So the more volume, the more neurons, and the more um, 
interactions between neurons. Synapses are when two neurons come together, they discuss, like by sending chemicals between, uh, between each other. And because we have so many synapses in our brain that are dedicated to vision, that's why we can like have so much detail in this sense compared to others. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is so interesting because philosophers historically have had what some consider a prejudice or bias in favor of vision. A lot of our metaphors for knowledge have to do with sight, whether it's Plato's ideas or forms or this idea of, of truth as an unveiling or an enlightening. And I think right now there's really a push to resist that and to think more in terms of favor of touch or other senses. But then what you're saying is also that there it makes me think that there is a good reason for yes, the preference of vision that philosophers. Way. Yeah. yeah. If, we, if we were like coming down from dogs instead of apes, maybe we would have as much of brain like, dedicated to smell instead of vision. And then the smell would be so complicated that would be our main sense but not the case mm -hmm. and then we'd have a dog philosophy of knowledge as smell <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, okay. Okay. about which <laughs> about which i have written in my book now to insert myself oh okay. yes yes of course david uh, no i'm um, glad you inserted yourself. no no um, no but it, this makes me think that because of this primacy um i mean here we're focusing on uh, neurons and synapses and uh, brain activity uh, you're a doctor, which means that you see people who have difficulties uh, related to vision. Yes. And so that must add an element of seriousness and weightiness to something like visual balls for people who already had vision. Um, because, yeah, it, it, you're right. It's not just culturally and philosophically, but for those people who have vision, who have sight, um, it, it, we rely on it a lot a lot. A yeah. lot more uh, on our everyday interactions than we think we rely on the other senses, although, of course, we rely on the other ones, too. Yeah, I mean, rightfully, because it's so easy like to just understand the world around us by just looking at it and to interact with the world by just looking at it. But yes, I mean, losing vision is devastating and patients who are losing vision, they feel like their world is falling apart, but they... In those cases, they develop the other senses and they develop the addition. They actually can do things that they never believed ahead of time that they'd be able to do. They can like go around, even uh, not outside. Obviously, they have no sight at all. Uh, they're totally completely blind. They will still be able to move around their place. And they get along and with a lot of help they can overcome uh, this disability. Mm -hmm. And thinking about visual, these kind of breakdowns of visual perception, whether through, you know, a disease that leads to vision loss or something else. Um, I'm curious how you as a scientist understand visual pathologies. Like what, what is happening when visual perception is breaking down or collapsing, um, if, if there's even sort of a general category yes. under which we can subsume various yes. pathologies. Okay. So this is going to be a little complicated because, um, so people tend to think that vision is only the eyes. It's actually a little thing uh, that lets us see. To have a perfectly good vision, you have to think of the whole visual pathway that goes from the cornea, so the front of the eye, to the brain behind. And anything on this pathway that will not work will decrease your vision. It, it's extremely, it's very rare to have complete blindness. People see, people who don't see well or have um, decreased vision, they will have different kinds of decreased vision depending on the part of the visual pathway that will be impaired. Mm. So a person who will have visual loss because of cataract will have a totally different experience from a person who has visual loss because of a compressive optic neuropathy. I will develop that maybe a little later. Uh, so when someone come to the, comes to the clinic and says they have decreased vision, we have to localize where the problem is. And um, the goal of the examination is actually 
to determine what part of the visual pathway is uh, the, where the problem is. So first is localization of the problem. So we start by exam examining uh, each eye separately and then both eyes, and then we look at the funders and if everything is normal from an eye doctor's standpoint, then we think of the brain and have an MRI uh, done to, to check for uh, the neurons. Um, so yeah, we mostly think in terms of uh, localization. Sometimes you will have both eyes, I mean, both visual fields, both eyes that will not work well, and we will know where in the brain the lesion will be. Well, so yeah, we, we have to do many different examination, like visual acuity, visual field, color vision, contrast vision. So all of those are things that we do on a daily basis. It's not just like how much can you see? And then we know what it is. We cannot just, uh, okay, you see 20, 10, uh, or 20, a hundred. And then we, see, we know what kind of this is. We have to go through all those steps. Mm -hmm. um, before making a diagnosis. Um, okay. And then, of and course, you... there's something else outside. Will also, it will also give clues because uh, yeah. the eyes not, are not just like an island uh, in the middle of nowhere. Can you give us a few examples? Um, maybe mine is too boring, but as you can see, I'm wearing my glasses. I usually wear my yeah. contacts, but I'm terribly yeah. nearsighted. I can barely, like if I take these off, I can't even really see the screen very well. <laughs> no. um, and that's probably very different from somebody who has, you know, like a, a different kind of pathology with their eyes. So what might be some examples okay, so there? In your case, we would not say that it's a pathology because if you use glasses, you can see perfectly well, just like me, right? Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Okay. So it's just that your eye is a little longer than usual. So the light doesn't end right on the retina. Uh, mm. So let me break down this a little... Uh, so, so, so it's a little more clear. The eyes are the organs that are going to translate the light into an um, ele uh, electric signal for the brain to understand it. So the lights come inside the eye, it goes through the cornea and through the pupil, which is the little black dot in the center. Mm -hmm. The cornea and the pupil are going to diverge the light so it hits the retina right away. And the retina at the back of the eye is the, the, the part of the eye that's going to translate the, the stimulus, so it has a full receptors, the stimulus mm -hmm. into an electric signal. Um, in your case, in your sightness, your eye is a little too long. So the light, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the light ends in front of the retina instead of hitting the retina. And the glass store okay. here only to diverge the light a little more so it hits the retina. You would think I would know this having had glasses since I was a <laughs> child, but in fact, if I did know it at some point, I have forgotten. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. That's cool. Yeah. With the glasses on, the, the light hits the retina and you see perfectly well that, that all your cells work, work perfectly well. So mm -hmm. you don't have any pathology. So anything that's going to uh, keep the light from entering the eye and hit the retina will be considered. Uh, and eye disease. And the first one, the most common one, is cataract. Mm -hmm. The cataract is the lens that is in the eye that does the work when you are not near sighted that, that accommodates and lets you see at near uh, because, because of the accommodation and it diverge, diverges the light so it hits the retina right away. And the cataract happens when this lens becomes a little too white in older people because it ages and so it blocks the light. The light doesn't enter the eye and you need surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have all kinds of diseases in the retina, all kinds of diseases in the optic nerve that comes from the eye to the brain. So it gets the information from the retina and takes it to the brain. So you, and all of those diseases are uh, not and can not be treatable because you lose cells that were supposed to transfer information. So it seems like a lot of these um, conditions um, can be classified into first light entering the eye, you know, if something blocks, if the angle is not right, right. and then we try to correct to make sure that the light, the light rays land in the right place. But then there can be other 
conditions that have to do with the trans the translation of light energy into ele- into an electrical signal, right. and then the delivery of that to the brain. Um, and, and so I like thinking about what you're calling here the visual pathway or the visual circuit as maybe having these like main steps uh, of like reception of the eye, translation of the light, and then delivery for later processing, and each one potentially going wrong in different ways. Yes. Um, and then your job as a, as a doctor is to identify those that potentially can be fixed with medical intervention versus those that can't. And so I, I now want to, so we've been talking about um, the ways in which vision can break down generally um, based on the various subsystems. I want to zoom in uh, to use a visual metaphor, mm-hmm. uh, a little bit more the discussion on one particular um, condition. And the reason is because a lot of philosophers write about what are known as the visual agnosias. Um, and for our listeners, um, you know, this is a technical term that just means uh, agnosia comes from um, gnosis, which is knowledge, and uh, the prefix a, which means without uh, or in the absence of. So a visual agnosia is a uh, condition in which subjects do not know um, what they see or that they see, uh, or that they don't see, actually. Um, And and so it's a problem of knowledge, and I find it fascinating. Um, For instance, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Maurice uh, Merleau-Ponty, writes about... each of us has at least one YouTube video on our channel. (laughs) Yes, uh, a, a popular figure here at Overthink. He writes a lot about visual agnosias, trying to develop a philosophical theory of vision that explains how visual agnosias are possible. And so I, I want you to talk to us a little bit about the scientific interpretation of, of the agnosias and you know what kinds of questions they raise, how they manifest themselves. Maybe give us a, an example or two to make it come alive. Okay, so why they happen, I will not be able to answer this question because <laughs> nobody knows. Uh, oh really? We, oh yeah, I we know. That, so we're talking about brain here. Uh, Diagnoses happen if the brain has damage. Uh, so we're talking about the occipital lobe in the back uh, of your head, uh, where all the visual information arrives, and part of the visual uh, cortex, the occipital cortex, is dedicated to recognition of some things, and then another part of it is dedicated to make sense of the whole scene that one sees. Uh, but I mean, it's not only that, because vision is so complicated that you have areas of the occipital lobe that are dedicated to, for example, recognizing people, recognizing people's face, um, um, or understanding a complicated scene. So an agnosia, I mean, the most simple one is when you show a thing to someone and is unable to say what it is. So I show you an apple, you cannot, you say, I don't know what that is. I give you the apple, you like manipulate it and you understand that, oh, this is an apple. So this is the most basic agnosia. Uh, and then you have things that are a little more, more subtle. Um, uh, so the recognition of faces, for example, uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Brad Pitt came out as having prosopagnosia, which is... Wait, well, who? Brad, Brad Pitt? Yes. Oh, oh wow. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Oh, yeah. okay. So One of my best friends that. has it as well. Yes. Yeah. That was recently, I, I remember uh, saying that in an interview and saying that he would be in a, in a place with a lot of people and he might not recognize somebody he knows because he has mm. this condition. Uh, well, in his case, that's not really a condition. That's something that was not developed enough, probably, in his childhood, huh. the ability of recognizing people's face, which actually can have the same, the, the natural condition that happens like within a second when you have a stroke in this uh, part of the brain. So from one second to another, you can be not able uh, anymore to recognize someone next to you that you know, and even your own face in the mirror. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so this is a more 
this is what we call the associative uh, agnosia, visual agnosia. So it's a little bit more, uh, I can say, focused on one mm -hmm. ability. The other most common one is the simultagnosia. Is uh, it's the one where you're able to uh, describe uh, when you're unable to describe a scene that is shown to you. For example, um, if I show you a picture, it's a famous picture people can uh, call it, where there is a boat that is sinking and you have rescuers coming to save the boat and a helicopter on top of the boat trying to save people. And the person who has similar technology will look at the, this picture and say, okay, I see a boat, it is sinking, and oh, there are people on the boat here, or there is a helicopter, but they will never say, this is a sinking boat and there are people going to save it from more. So it's the synthesis, the synthesis. of the whole. They identify the elements, yeah. but not the, the meaning of the whole. Of, yeah. And, yeah, Sim okay. simultaneously, right? Most, so, yes, exactly. Simultaneously, simultaneous. yes, you're unable to understand simultaneously different things different things happening in the, in the same scene. And the most mm -hmm. uh, basic one is like if I draw the letter H for you without using lines, but just little uh, Fs. For example, if I use little Fs to draw mm -hmm. an H, the person will say, "I see Fs," but I that's what I see, and they will never be able to say. Those Fs draw an H. Okay. And wow. so in, in these cases, yes. um, and, you know, you said that this is obviously a, a, something that has to do with the brain. Yes. Um, as a neuro-ophthalmologist, um, what happens then if somebody shows up to the clinic with one of these uh, presentations? Well, so this draws attention to uh, the risk of dementia. Uh, those patients, they they end up having a more widespread dementia that will uh, give them other problems later. But sometimes it happens to the first or the first symptom. I see. So okay. they come and they say, "Well, I cannot read those little letters, but their their eyes work perfectly well. Their brain is fine, and so it's just the beginning of some kind of." Uh, visual agnosia, and that's mm -hmm. when we need to refer them to the neurologist who will take care of them and try to delay as, like, as much as possible the beginning of dementia. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think the whole range of experiences that you're talking about for philosophers puts pressure on an assumption that many in the history of philosophy have made, which is that we just kind of passively receive external stimuli. And, you know, in this in this kind of blank slate or tabula rasa of the mind, that stimuli get impressed upon us through the medium of the eyes. And, you know, even though based on the description you gave, about the conversion of stimuli into electrical signals, it sounds like that's not entirely wrong. It's wrong in the sense that it overlooks the complexity of the visual system and the way that we are sort of actively rising to meet yes. this experience. This definition applies to all the senses. Like yeah. the conversion of a stimuli into electric signal. I mean, I don't know if I had like uh, in the like an organ that would be able to read Wi-Fi signal, this would be another, you know, another sense. <laughs> this is just a stimuli, and I have a receptor for Wi-Fi, and this would be another, like, imaginary sense. But mm -hmm. that does not define what I, I'm able to do with this Wi-Fi. Can I, like, watch movies just like Totally. Like but it, yeah. you need the processor behind you need the brain, the part of the brain that is able to understand this stimulus. And yeah. Just, well, and this leads me to think about the development of the senses over time, because I think sort of related to that impression that the sense is just uh, or that the sight is just the kind of Im passive impression of things right. upon right. us is this related prejudice that we sort of spring into the world already seeing things right. in the way that we do as adults. Right. And this no. is, in fact, not the case. So tell us a little bit about how sight develops right. over time. Well, it, is, it is true that babies see they do see. As soon as they are born, they do see. But if you could ask them what they see, they would tell you that this, they, they were able to describe what they see as an adult. They would tell you, I see a big black dot here, and I see lights everywhere, just like a tree without any leaves. 
Um, and those are actually the optic nerve and mm -hmm. the vessels that are on the retina. So they're seeing Wait. their own eyes. No, they're seeing their own optic nerve. How so? Because where the optic nerve is and where the, the arteries and the vessels are, there is no photoreceptors. So it's like blank space. Oh, there I see. No so like if you... So if you think about the retina, there are parts where there is no photoreceptors. Yes. And so they're actually like seeing the absence of, exactly. of receptivity. Part, I see. I see. I'm so sure. Okay. Like the photoreceptors are covered okay. by the vessels. So the light doesn't reach okay. them. And well, where the optic nerve is, there is a black, black dot. When you do a visual field test, you do see the black dot actually on the visual test result, on the visual mm. field uh, result. So... Now we don't see it anymore, even though we yeah, why not? Kind of, we we <laughs> don't see it because our brain understood that this this is not a threat. You know, these images are useless. We we don't need to see them. So it it develops an algorithm so it takes off those images that come from the inside of the eye mm -hmm. because they are not a threat and. Sometimes when you look at a white wall, you can see things like moving a little bit. Those are uh, floors, and those floors keep changing. They are uh, in the eye cavity, but and because they change every day, then you're able to see if you pay attention to that. Mm. But what are they exactly? Because I do have a white wall in front of me, and I I see little floaters. Are floaters, they just like yeah. are they like little pieces of trash in the in the eye they are actually? Well, just like any organ, with the with with the <laughs> when the eye works, does its job, then it produces trash, and the trash has to be digested somehow. And that's what oh my God. happens. <laughs> and you, I have a really polluted eye. <laughs> and surprise, your di your eye has a digestive system that yes. may or may not yeah, be constipated. Pretty much, pretty much. Um, like yes. Yeah. And I mean, I want to ask a, a follow-up here, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and because you said that a child would see, you know, this absence of reception because the photoreceptors are covered by, uh, by other parts of the eye. Mm -hmm. Over time, and we still have that, you know, with the blind spot at the center of vision that can be yes. revealed uh -huh. in, in a test. Uh -huh. But the brain, you said, learns that it is not a threat. And so this draws attention uh, in a very clear way to what Ellie was alluding to, which is that maybe the more creative rather than passive dimension of our visual yeah. field, which is that the thing that I see right now, it's not as if I just opened my eyes and boom, it was there. The brain had to learn to create it, yes. and and so it, it had to learn to ignore things like you know right. there is a there is a black hole in the middle that I don't see, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and so I'm just wondering whether you can say a little bit more about how mm, how we can appreciate that creative element or where else we see it. There, where else? So there is another example for. Uh, so the photoreceptors uh, in the retina, not all of them can see colors, for example. Only the ones in the center of the retina are able to see the colors. So if you were able to ask a kid, like a baby, literally a baby who just like, uh, was born, what color do you see? They tell you that everything on the side is actually colorless. It's just like shades of gray. And in the center, everything is colorful. But when you think of it, your visual field is colored everywhere, but it's not because you have receptive <laughs> color. It's just because your brain knows the colors of objects. Yeah. So it creates the hallucination that you see colors on the sides, which is not the case. Oh, yeah. Nice. There are some contemporary philosophers and uh, phenomenologists who write about this. Um, um, I know Alva Noe, mm, uh, who writes yeah. a lot about um, perception, talks about the fact that it, it's really paradoxical because our peripheral vision is actually great, even as adults. Yeah. And it, it, it's just that we cannot, like, as soon as you look, you make it the center of your vision. So it's like impossible to attend to. 
And as soon as you try to, you fill it with color, which means that you can never actually see this grayness. I'm trying so hard out. right now. It's not I, know, I see, I see <laughs> Ellie's eyes through the it's glasses really trying to impossible. capture the periphery. It's really impossible to... Actually, mm -hmm. Probably there are people like out there who can do that or people who don't have it and are like, oh, wow, are you supposed to see colors in the sides? Um, yeah. But I don't oh. think that if you do see colors all over your visual field, you cannot unsee that. That would be... Okay. Very difficult. Well, and, and this, I think, leads is so interesting. I, I think it leads to a final question, perhaps, for you today, which is um, how we make sense of those cases in which people think they're seeing things that they aren't actually seeing. And so, for instance, um, as you can probably tell from this interview, I don't know a lot about <laughs> vision, but uh, there's the condition of cortical blindness, which I understand is when people actually are clinically, they, they do have clinical visual impairment, but they don't recognize it. They think they're seeing things as they normally would. What is going on there? Okay, so, so we're talking of two separate things here. Cortical blindness is when you don't see because the because the brain, the occipital lobe doesn't work well. So okay, okay. blindness encompasses many, many diseases. Because I see. The thing you're talking about is actually a nosognosia is a word in English. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm like yes as a non-expert, but it, <laughs> it sounds, sounds perfectly it sounds intelligible. Right. It sounds right. medical. <laughs> it's when you're not aware that you are blind. So this okay. happens only when the cortical lo lobes are uh, involved. So not in all cortical lobes uh, diseases, only in okay. small. Uh, but yes, some patients would swear that they do see things, but it's just because they are not aware that they have this condition. You see that with other kind of uh, stroke. For example, some people forget that they uh, cannot move the right side of their body. It's, it's, it's kind of the same. It's anosognosia also. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, in the, in the context of vision, it can be dangerous because people will just like get up and go like, walk around thinking that they do see things. When actually they oh. obviously don't, uh, but yes, because so you're are now, they thinking they're are they like failing to see a pole in front of them, or is it that they're actually they think they're seeing things that aren't there? Like, can you see? No, actually, they're so they have to be completely blind in this case, so they oh. don't they won't see anything because the brain is not able to process any visual Got information, it. and from. This. But they believe that they see. They believe that they wow. see because the brain is not sending the information that no vision is happening somehow. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't really know how this happened and why those patients are not aware that they cannot see. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of information so, somehow. They don't have the information that they don't see or maybe they do have some kind of hallucination that we're not able to comprehend. Uh, which happens in other kinds of diseases when you're completely blind, but not from the brain. So uh, your brain starts uh, producing images, and then you do see actually images because your brain like makes them happen, but they're not real. And people who have that are aware that it's not the real world around them because they still have this place in their brain that tells them that this is fake or a hallucination. Huh. No, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and it just makes me think about how, as you mentioned, so much of our brain is devoted to vision. It is by far the most studied and the best understood of our sensory modalities. And yet, and yet. you know, there are these questions of like, we don't really know how it is that people have um, a lot of different kinds of visual experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a lot more to learn there. Um, but I, I think we are at the end of our interview and uh, we want to thank you a lot, Dr. Thank Ash, you. for being with us. This has been extremely educational. Um, I, I want to like follow up with all of these follow-up <laughs> questions to you because this is so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it's been amazing to have you on. It, it's really shedding light on vision for me, so I appreciate it. Illuminating, uh, yes. Um, and uh, again, we, we thank you for the time. And uh, um, yeah. thank you for Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks to our viewers. Right. <laughs>